Good morning, this is Jessica from Corp U, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Smarter Growth series with Corp U faculty and best-selling author of Built to Win and Resolve, Negotiating Life's Conflicts with Greater Confidence, Hal Movius. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Should you have any issues during the webinar, please type a question into the question box and I will assist you. The presentation and slides will be shared after the webinar. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Corpus founder and CEO, Alan Todd. Alan? Thank you, Jessica. Welcome, everybody, to the Corpus Smarter Growth Series. Our focus is leadership insights that are rooted in management science. And I'm really excited about today's guest, Hal Movius. So Hal wrote a best-selling book, Built to Win. He's been teaching negotiation strategies for many, many years. He just published a new book, Resolve, and it's all about helping to build greater confidence. And Hal's going to share with us some of the insights uh, that he's that he's developed over a career uh, in negotiations and some of the research and bring us up to speed on what's what's happening and give us a little sneak preview into the future of what negotiating with greater confidence through Resolve would look like. So to, before we get into that, I'd love to just sort of frame how we think about the world at Corp U. And so everything we do at Corp U is aligned about around building high impact leaders. And so we've built a platform, which some people think of as executive education in a box, and we partner with world-class experts. We have a large expert network and Hal Movius is one of those people. And we put their content on our platform and we tailor the programs for customers. So all of our pro all of our programs are expert led. They're rooted in real problems that you work on and your teams work on, and they're integrated with work. So you do things for 30 minutes a day, typically no more than three hours a week for one to three weeks. And that's the way we've chunked all of the programs. And we've run over a hundred plus thousand leaders through the Corp U platform. We track the impact that those leaders create on their organizations. We're over a billion and our net promoter scores continue to be uh, at very high rates. Um, and the world that we live in at Corp U, we sort of frame, if you think about those things that are taught in executive education, these are the programs that we build. And with, together with our customers and our expert network, we build the programs to solve burning issues that are going on in the marketplace. And those can be general management. Right now, we hear a lot about digital businesses, a hot topic, talent management, change management negotiation to functional management. So quite a bit in sales and supply chain and operations. And we typically do that with customers that are trying to drive some large scale change initiative or transformation. They're trying to drive a culture change or they're trying to build an organization specific capability. Negotiation is a great example today of building an organizational capability. And we do that for managers and leaders at all levels. So without further ado, let's talk about consulting a little bit. So a couple of research findings that I found to be kind of fascinating, and that is that a supermajority of companies say they don't have a negotiation strategy and they don't track any post-negotiation success, but yet that same supermajority of people rate negotiation as a critical area to get better. So it's an area, it's very interesting to me, that's an area where we have to have an organizational capability, but we're not that good at it. And you say, why do we have to have that capability? So you look at it, we know that executives and marketing and managers, just about every knowledge worker in business has to negotiate. And we think today organizations are capturing maybe 15% of that benefit of, of better negotiations. And if we could build that capability, there's 85% untapped potential that we can go to. And some of the research tells us that a company can boost profits by 7% by becoming better negotiators. They can improve revenue. They can improve sales, uh, sales force effectiveness. So these are things that immediately impact the top and bottom line just by building, just by focusing on building some negotiation capability. And it, we, we know that there are some basic things you can do like role play a negotiation in advance and you can create 53% better chance of predicting the outcome. When we look at supply chain, and procurement and strategic sourcing. It's one of the most important skills for creating win-win outcomes for large organizations. And finally, we have 
the whole program, the whole Art of Negotiations program, this is taught at world famous institutions around the world. And uh, we, we've built this in partnership with the Consensus Building Institute and Hal Movius Day, and he's our lead faculty in our Art of Negotiation program. But we have programs one week long, three week long is 15 weeks long. So we have them chunked into everything in between. So without further ado, I am gonna turn it over to Hal, I'm gonna switch over here to your presentation. And with that, Hal, take it away. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's great to be with you. And um, I guess, you know, it's funny. I was reflecting with those great um, statistics and studies that you've just shared with us, Alan. I've really spent a lot of the last 15 years of my career trying to think about why both individuals and companies have such a hard time applying really critical concepts to their negotiations and to their influence challenges too. Um, and so 10 years or so ago, Larry Suskind and I wrote a book called Built to Win that really was about thinking about negotiation as an organizational capability. Most organizations send people um, to training, but the nature of the training is such that it takes place over one or two days. People go to it, they come back, they try to implement what they've learned, and the more time that goes by, um, the harder it is to do that, especially if you come from an organization with several hundred or several thousand or tens of thousands of people, and you were one of a handful of people that went. That's a very hard uh, mandate to come back with. Um, and so Built to Win really focused on what um, organizations can do. And I think uh, a really good learning program like the one that Corpio has put together is, is a critical piece of that. In recent years, I've become interested in another barrier to what keeps people from doing the things that they know they probably should do in a negotiation. Ask good questions. Really listen. Really summarize. Spend a little time inventing before you commit to things. There's, you know, we're 40 years now almost after the publication of Getting to Yes, and there have been many good books on negotiation since then. Um, but unfortunately, the world has not really, with a few exceptions, seen uh, a transformation in the way that we negotiate in business uh, or anywhere else. So another factor um, that I've been focused on is why people in the moment, the heat of the moment, why we kind of lose confidence, and lose our cool, and revert to old patterns. And especially when you really know the person well, if you've been working with someone on your team for many years or you know, in our families or with our neighborhood associations, um, old patterns die hard. So um, I got very interested in teaching people, well, first in the first instance about whether we should teach people to be more confident. And there are a couple ways of thinking about this. Um, and maybe the next slide, you know, fundamental question is, is it a good idea to teach people to be more confident in the negotiating arena or as leaders? Um, next slide, if you, if you think about some of the recent books that have been bestsellers, there's clearly a hunger out there for, um, for being able to approach conflict and approach negotiation with less fear, with more of a sense of self-assuredness. Um, and so, there are books that have really, I think, struck a chord because people are hungry to figure out, even when they're confident in other parts of their life, they say, well, why is it that when I go to negotiate at my annual review or when I go to negotiate with my team, I just kind of, you know, everything kind of goes out the window and I compromise and, you know, why is that? Um, if we go to the next slide, when I brought this idea up with my colleagues in the academic world, and I said, gee, there's an awful lot of hunger out there to help people be more confident as leaders and as negotiators. The response was pretty much uniformly negative. And the reason for that is that a lot of research over the last 30 years or so has convincingly demonstrated that human brains are very fallible and that they tend to make predictable mistakes. And especially in situations where, uh, like conflict, where we're operating on, uh, under the condition of threat or under high arousal, um, things 
things kind of revert um, to what Dan Kahneman calls system one thinking, our just intuitive, quick, leap to conclusions brain. And that brain operates very efficiently and uses all kinds of shortcuts that in many ways um, can be helpful, but that in situations where really critical thinking is required can also be disastrous. And so when I went to colleagues and said, should we teach people to be more confident? They basically said, you're out of your mind. That'll make everything worse. All conflicts will be, people will dig in more. Um, all of the biases and heuristics that we know they have will be reinforced. So don't do it. Um, I'd like to show you maybe a very short clip. And this is from the movie Defending Your Life with Albert Brooks and Meryl Streep. And in the scene that we're about to see, um, Albert Brooks is going in for a job interview and he's asked his wife to help him prepare for the job interview because he wants to really be assertive and he's saying, you know, help me practice. So we're going to watch him practice and then we're going to watch the first few minutes of the interview. Do this for me, it helps. Not now, I mean it. Come on, do it. What do you want me to do? Be him. It's silly. It's not silly. It helps me. Offer me 55000 no more. How much do you want? How much are you offering me? $55,000. I can't work here for a penny under sixty-five. I'm sorry. Well, I can't pay you sixty-five. dollars Well, I can't work here. 58000 65. 59? 65. 60? 65. 61. Let me make it plain. I cannot take the job for under 65, under no conditions. Danielle, I'm prepared to offer you $49,000. I'll take it. I'm going to get you a parking place. Okay. Okay. So, um, <laughs> first of all, we see good. maybe some... Uh, some job inflation, uh, some 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 inflation since that uh, um, clip was came out in the early 80s. But um, in any case, um, you know, it's easy to kind of dismiss Albert Brooks's character as sort of a schmuck. Uh, you know, he gave in so quickly. He practiced, 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 and he gave in so quickly. But unfortunately, I see so many versions of this in the real world, and. If we take seriously the idea that even fairly confident and very capable people sometimes just fold, it's a really interesting phenomenon. So again, as a person interested in why people don't do the things they should do in negotiation, I take this seriously. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, again, these are the kinds of questions that I'm interested in. Should we seek to be more confident? And should we teach others to be more confident? And if so, how do you teach them to do that? Can you teach somebody to be more confident? And if we go to the next slide, that, that in turn begs a really fundamental question, which is what does it mean to be truly confident? Not to be sort of maybe trash talking somebody on the field, not to be full of bluster and bravado and braggadocio, but to really be confident. So, um, it's actually interesting when you go to look for a definition of self-confidence, um, there's a fair amount of variation depending on where you look. And here's what I settled on. It's a feeling or belief that we or, a, or I as a single person can do something well, a sense of self-assuredness in a particular situation. So I want to unpack that for a minute. It's Notice that there's a feeling associated with it. There's an emotion around it. There's also a belief or an expectation. Notice that it's about doing something. It's about performing or being able to do an activity or, um, or interact with somebody well. And notice that it's in a particular situation. Um, so it, if we go to the, and one more thing, if we just you click forward, the technical definition, if you're the kind of person who's as geeky as I am about this stuff, is that confidence is really a self-relevant attitude toward performance in a specific situation or context. So if we go to the next slide, notice what confidence isn't. 
it's not the same when we define it this way as global self-esteem. It's not feeling like I'm okay generally, I'm a good person generally, I'm the kind of person who, you know, I kind of like myself. But that doesn't mean that I feel like I'm going to be a good ice skater or good at playing the saxophone or get good at giving the presentation next week. Notice it's also not the same as competence. That is, although being becoming better at something probably gives us more confidence in it, builds our what we psychologists call self-efficacy, a sense that we can be effective at it. Those things can also be disastrously unconnected. And um, David Dunning and Justin Kruger did a famous study that you may have read about years ago, where they looked at um, uh, how incompetent people see themselves. And it turns out that if you give people a task to do, and then afterward you say, how good at the task do you think you were? The people who were the best at the task in the top 20% rated themselves as being like in the 75th percentile. I think I did well, but I'm not really that sure. But the people who are the least competent, the bottom 10%, rated themselves as being in the 70th percentile. So just about as good as the most effective people, they had no idea how incompetent they were. And I hope every, probably, if you're anything like me and you're listening in, you're, you've now thought of one or two people in your life. Um, but the point is, we don't want to assume that becoming more competent will necessarily uh, help you be more confident. And we don't want to assume that just because you seem like a confident person that you're actually good at something. And the last thing is it's not a Goldilocks problem. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you ask people, hey, do you think it's a good idea for leaders to be confident? Do you think it's a good idea for negotiators to be confident? Most people will go, hmm, well, you don't want to be a pushover. So yeah, you should be confident. Mm, yeah, but then yeah, I guess you don't want to be overly confident. So maybe something in the middle, just right. You know, that's the Goldilocks solution. Not too hot, not too cold. You should kind of be somewhere in the middle, sort of confident. Or, um, you know, years ago, Jim Collins defined uh, level five leadership as, as uh, you know, confidence and humility, which um, I like. But it still begs the question of what we mean by, um, by humility, uh, by confidence. So if we go to the next slide, um, one of the interesting things about the attitude uh, research is um, the attitude research tells us that when it comes to how people see something, there are really three components. There's the behavioral component, which is, you know, how do I do something or how do I feel about my ability to do something. There's the cognitive component, which is how I think about it. And there's the emotional component, which is how I feel about it. And so if we think about confidence as a self-relevant relevant attitude, maybe we can just back up um, a couple clicks here and take them one at a time. Um, we, want to, uh, we want to really disaggregate it in the same way. So the first component, when you think about being a better negotiator um, or handling conflict better, is do I do this well? Do I have mastery, a sense of fluency, the ability to act or speak without having to think a lot about it? And you might call this know-how. Um, you might call it fluency, second nature. Do you imagine any complex activity, whether it's like um, learning to ride a unicycle or bake a complicated dish uh, or um, take a new shortcut home or play a sonata on the piano. Um, these are not things that you kind of read about in a book or watch somebody else do 12 times or watch a movie and then you kind of go and do it right after. It takes practice. It takes a lot of practice. And the first few times you do it, you know, you really have to consult the guide or go back and look at the instructions or read the music. But after you've done it 500 times, you can just do it. Your fingers have found the right way. Your mind knows how to sift through the ingredients in the kitchen and so forth. So that's the first component. The second component is awareness. And this is where we want to be able to deploy systematic thinking. So I mentioned system one earlier as kind of our intuitive brain that leaps to conclusions, uh, uses intuition, often serves us well, but can really lead us astray. And what we want to do at critical moments, particularly moments like negotiation, 
is to deploy more systematic thinking to help us overcome those mental mistakes and traps that we fall into. And a couple of the things that can help here, and maybe we'll talk about them a little more in the Q&A, are some tools and checklists to help us manage attention. I'll just say briefly as an aside, um, if, if there's a great book by Atul Gawande called The Checklist Manifesto. He was very interested in, in how do you get surgeons in complicated surgical theaters to make fewer mistakes. There's so many mistakes uh, made in the medical system by really brilliant people. Uh, how do you reduce um, uh, airline danger, airline fatalities? How do pilots click off on all the things that they have to do before they take off? Well, it turns out how to construction sites, etc. Well, it turns out checklists, a lot of checklists, and then you can do checklists in better or worse ways. A terrific little book, but short checklists that check people as a team through a set of activities are a way of preventing us from falling into um, shortcuts or, or leaps that we don't want to make. And then finally, the last component is the emotional component, which I call poise. And this is the ability in a situation where we're negotiating or we're in a difficult conversation to be aware of our feelings and the feelings of other people, but not driven by them, not reacting to them. We want to be alert, calm, able to choose among different ways of responding. And the thing, of course, that gets in the way of this is anxiety. Um, not exclusively. We can get angry very quickly or um, have uh, jealousy or other emotions distort um, our ability to respond more rationally. But I think overwhelmingly, um, when you look at the research, what keeps people in negotiations and conflicts from being more rational, more cool, more productive, more creative is anxiety. And just to drive this home, if we go to the next slide, we, uh, my colleague Joanna Chango and I did some research a couple of years ago. We looked at 400 people globally. Um, we asked them to rate the pleasantness or unpleasantness of various activities. Some of them were nice activities, like you find a $20 bill in the street. Some of them are neutral activities, like you're chewing gum or reading a book. And then some of them are negative activities, like having to sit through a long, hot funeral or having your car break down, run out of gas in the middle of a crowded freeway. And if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> you'll see people tend to not like these activities very much. You ask them how unpleasant would it be to be stuck overnight in an airport with no place to sleep? And the answer is, I don't like that at all on a scale of you know, one to seven. I rate that like a 1.5. But here's what's interesting. If we click on the next group of statements, look at these statements that have to do with conflict and negotiation and influence challenges. I want to raise an issue with, I have to raise an issue with a friend when I think it might lead to a fight or an argument. I'm being sent to negotiate, but with unreasonable expectations about what can be achieved. I might have to threaten somebody in order to get what I want. I might have to argue with a roommate. These were statistically no different in their unpleasantness from having to sleep on the airport floor all night, for example. So I think this is a sort of startling <laughs> reminder that most of us, not everybody, but that most of us consider conflict and negotiations to be somewhat stressful. Just if we go to the next slide, I'll say this problem does not go away even when you get to the top of organizations. When you ask CEOs, would you like executive coaching um, if you could, if you had the time, if you had the right person, et cetera, and three quarters of them say yes. Then you say, what would you like coaching with? And by far, the biggest response is managing conflict. So, and I see this working with um, leaders, officers, and companies. Um, even when you get to the top of the company, it doesn't mean that conflict becomes any less stressful. So, um, a question if we're going to tackle confidence and help people be better negotiators is why is it so stressful? And if we go to the next slide, one way to think about conflict or negotiations is that there's different kinds of problems that we might be trying to solve at the same time. And I use the metaphor of a, a crucible, these ingredients interacting under pressure that um, can, under the right circumstances, generate something really valuable at the end. Um, but these are some of the problems we might be trying to solve. First of all, there are material goals. There are things we want. 
we're making a decision or we're exchanging goods or services or we want um, someone's behaviors or beliefs to change. I want you to stop doing something or I want you to start doing more of something. Those are things that we are trying to get done. Then there's building and protecting social capital. We want life to be better and easier over time. We need to work with and through other people. We want our relationships and reputation not to get worse because that makes life harder, makes negotiating harder if nobody trusts us. So somehow I need to achieve my material goals, but do it in a way that doesn't degrade my social capital. Then the last problem, and this is one that I think is very often under the radar, but most powerful for some of us, is I'm in, I'm in this interaction or I'm anticipating this interaction, and part of what's driving me is the need to manage my emotions and the emotions that I imagine or fear that other people might feel or might exhibit. So for some of us going in, we might be thinking, you know, I just don't want the other person to get angry. Or we might be thinking, I, I just, I'm afraid in this situation that that person's going to say something to me that's going to set me off. Or they're going to say something to me that makes me feel just so small and insignificant and I just want to crawl out the door. And so there are these emotional minefields and they're very personal and very idiosyncratic. But that's clearly also something that drives behavior in conflict. So if we go to the next slide, one of the interesting things I found is I, as I looked um, at the research and was writing Resolve, you wonder, how do we learn to deal with conflict? Well, you know, it's, not like, um, it's not like there's a sort of primer that everybody goes through. We learn in our families. We learn on the playground. We learn from watching other people. Maybe we get a few um, rules and ground rules in school, which is good. But mostly we learn intuitively. And one of the things that's really clear from the last 50 years of research in psychology is that the dominant response to conflict in most human beings, and in fact in most primates, is avoidance. So we think of avoidance as such a negative thing, like, well, if you avoid conflict, it will fester, and blah, so probably true. And also the dominant response. People don't like conflict. It's extremely stressful. Consequently, they put off having the difficult conversation. They decide not to say anything to the roommate. They decide, somebody was telling me that she just decided to park her car 10 blocks from her house every day rather than have a conversation with her roommate about whether they could alternate using the parking pass. So um, you may think of yourself as a conflict diverse person, but I'm here to tell you that probably describes a super majority of the population. Um, unfortunately, not everybody and people who like to jump into conflict and they do exist um, in a sense have an advantage because they're not trying to solve that third problem of, you know, avoiding other people's feelings or their own feelings. They also, there's some significant disadvantages over time, which I can talk about. So avoidance is one strategy. Another strategy, if we click on that, is just giving in. So some people just, I won't avoid it, but I'll go in and I'll basically give the other person what they want to keep the peace because, you know, da, 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 da. And the third strategy is, well, could we just compromise? I mean, compromise sounds good. Split the difference or you give a little, I give a little. And although that is a very efficient mechanism and one that's found in nearly every culture, there are some situations in which compromise is, is really inefficient. Um, you know, you can imagine that if you're completely uh, indifferent to the amount of a down payment, but you care a lot about the total cost of a good or service, and the other party is thinking, boy, I have a cash flow problem, the down payment matters a lot to me, it would be really inefficient to haggle about the down payment back and forth and split the difference and haggle about the total cost and split the difference. Better for each of us to be more flexible on the thing that's least important to us to get more of what we do want. The fourth strategy, and also a pretty dominant strategy, is to treat negotiations as an influence challenge and to think of it as you know, a set of tactics that range from being less aggressive to more aggressive. So you can look at, <clears throat> excuse me, you can look at pleading, suggestions, um, arguments, maybe some incentives, all the way up to threats or force, which I think of as more coercive. So we go from more 
<clears throat> persuasive tactics to more coercive tactics. And then the very end, the very last tactic that we, very last strategy we use, if we click on the next slide, is to negotiate. And that happens probably the least in responding to conflict. So I find that fascinating because I really believe, and I might be one of those guys with a hammer that sees everything as a nail, but I think negotiation is a really great tool. So a fundamental question is why is that? If we click on the next slide, it turns out that when you go and interview people in different companies and you say, tell me about a negotiation you had, and they tell you all these uh, different things that happened and, you know, we got up and walked away and this and that. It's very different than if you said, what kind of negotiator are you? And they say, oh, I'm collaborative, creative, patient, etc. all the things that they should say. And even you find in companies, um, I, I give an example in Built to Win of a company where, you know, I went in and I said, uh, I said, it sounds like these two divisions in your companies have fundamentally different goals sometimes. They say, yeah. It sounds like they have different forecasts sometimes. Yeah, they have to work together. They depend on each other. Yeah, so they need to negotiate better. No, 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 don't use that word. We're business partners. We partner. So even the word negotiate has, in some cases, this kind of um, negative connotation. But all of us have mental models of negotiation. Even my colleagues, Kim Leary and Mike Wheeler, some years ago did a study with Harvard Business School students. They asked them to make visual collages based on uh, the word negotiate. And what they got back were pictures of uh, somebody walking on a very tall balance beam with a pot of gold at the end, somebody on an island surrounded by sharks trying to build a ladder, you know, so forth. So a lot of peril and danger and anxiety, even among um, Harvard Business School students. Um, if we go to the next slide, you might be wondering what is the difference between negotiation and influence? And the formal difference, the way I would distinguish these things, is that influence is kind of fundamentally a one-way street. It's a person or group taking action or communicating in a way that is attempting to change the perceptions, beliefs, attitudes, or behaviors of another person or group. So I want you to feel differently, think differently, be ready to act differently, choose differently, stop doing something, start doing, I want you to do X or feel X. But negotiation is a little different. It's a process in which two or more parties who have some conflicting and some compatible goals seek to reach agreement on a decision or transaction. And notice here the critical distinction is I don't have to convince you that you have the wrong goals or that you value things, you're valuing the wrong things or that your view of the future doesn't match mine. And so uh, I have to argue with you until I persuade you that uh, the price of this commodity is going to go up or down. I can negotiate. We can disagree about these things and invent options that leave us both potentially um, better off. So if we go um, back to our model of teaching people about confidence, I just want to take these in turn. If we go, uh, if we go forward one slide, yep. Um, so there's our model again. And let's take these in turn. We'll go, we'll take mastery first. If we go to the next slide, one of the things that I think a good negotiation course does is to teach people three P's. So first there's preparation. We need to learn about the moves that we should make as we approach a conflict or negotiation. We want to use a process of preparation template. Um, we have some things we want to look at in terms of um, the consequences of no agreement, the interests of each side and so forth. But there's some analysis about the situation that we should do before we go in. Unfortunately, too often I see teams who just say, well, I've worked with this person for 20 years. I know what they're going to say, and I'm already preparing to, you know, to counter argue. And that's not really a very effective um, preparation process, but it's one that people default to all the time. The second thing you need is a process. You need some process model that says, what should I do once I sit down at the table with the other side? And I think it's very effective to have a negotiation process map. I know in the CorePU course, um, there's a process map that I think is a real, a really effective one. Um, and you use key communication practices. The three that I like to get people to remember are listen more than you talk, monitor the time and agenda, and act with integrity. So these are things you do throughout the process. And the final P is practice, the way that we make these moves more like second nature. And unfortunately, um, People, you know, they feel like it's goofy to role play or I don't want, I've been thinking about this for a whole year. It's my salary review. I've been, you know, I was up at 3 a.m. this morning. You know, I've got a whole head full of things to say. 
But lo and behold, if you go and try to say them out loud, there's a very big, often a very big gap between what we thought would come out and how coherent and convincing would be and what actually comes out. And so more and more companies, I find, are actually doing um, very disciplined um, role play negotiations um, where they try to mock out, mock up the negotiation. And as Alan said in the in the intro, um, there are some real benefits uh, to doing that. And I think there are also some key moves um, to focus on. So if we go to the next slide, um, the process map I use in Resolve is is uh, one where we focus on establishing in the first instance. So what's a shared opportunity, problem, or decision? Um, what are the goals for the meeting and so forth? Then we explore. So maybe we've already, maybe there's an existing proposal, uh, maybe not, but we want to spend some time exploring what's important to you. Why did you propose this? Is that more important than the other thing? Can we break price down into several different pieces and so forth? Then we invent. So we spend some time before we decide, seeing whether we can invent options, and then we put them into packages across issues. So we exploit differences. Then we decide, and we do that in a principled way. And then afterward, and this is again a huge opportunity that companies have, I think, is to capture, to capture really what's been agreed, to define measures and milestones, and really what have we learned from doing this. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so again, there are different ways to practice. You can do it alone, especially with smartphones now. Um, I tell people just practice the first three sentences you're going to say in the negotiation. Um, but uh, you could do it in a group session, and in a group session there are certain moves, maybe we'll talk about this in the Q&A, but particularly when you have large groups, if you're at a regional summit, you have 200 people, you pick one team, you say you're going to do a mock negotiation in front of your colleagues, that can go disastrously wrong, and there's some ways to do that better or worse. If we go to the next slide, um, when it comes to awareness, there are different ways that you can get people to be more systematic. And one I'll focus on here, or maybe two, is just encourage perspective taking. And of course, it makes sense to think about how does the other side see this problem? But when we're anxious and when time is short and when there's technical complexity and uncertainty and ambiguity and lots of people looking over our shoulder, we spend all our time thinking about how we're going to solve the problem because it's so difficult from our side and we don't get into the other side's head. But the research tells us that doing this leads to more valuable agreements, not just for both sides, but for us. If you want to be selfish, spend time getting into the head of your counterpart. And the other is maybe don't fear differences. It's okay if they value something different. It's okay if they have different expectations about the future. There are moves you can make uh, in mutual gains negotiation to handle those problems. Sometimes you have people who are too optimistic going into a negotiation, and there are moves that I describe and resolve um, to get people to be less uh, arrogant, you know, oh, they, they depend on us, we're their biggest customer, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, let's, let's use a little system two thinking. And then more often, people have talked themselves into a very dark place, you know, we don't have any leverage, our best alternative to a negotiated agreement is awful. We don't have one. They're just going to dictate blah, blah, blah. So there are things you can do also to get people out of that mind. If we go to the next slide, there's some things to do to manage emotion. And um, I'll go through these briefly, but emotion in negotiations and difficult conversations almost always comes from one of three places. We think a person is blocking our progress toward our goals, they are violating our sense of fairness, or they're talking to us or treating to treat talking to us or treating us in a way that we feel is inappropriate or that violates how we expect them to talk to us um, or treat us. Um, so knowing those in advance, I usually make a checklist with clients and say, let's take those apart. What are the things they might do that could trigger us? How might we respond in those moments? Let's practice. And then also, surprisingly, um, environmental and physiological effects in situations like this are quite large. And I'll just give you one. Um, years ago, um, there's research in, in uh, the Israeli uh, judicial system that looked at um, parolees. And it turns out there's um, if you're if you're coming up for parole, there are three one-hour meetings in the morning and three one-hour meetings in the afternoon. And you ask the judges, do you think you dispense, dispense justice 
equally throughout the day. And of course they say, yes, that's my sworn duty and so forth. But then you actually look at who gets parole and who doesn't. And it turns out if you come in right after breakfast or right after lunch, you have a two thirds chance of getting parole. If you come in right before lunch or right at the end of the day when people are hangry, you know, you have zero chance pretty much. Um, so there's again, checklists that I provide in, in Resolve to help people think about how to engineer the environment because that can make a big difference. If we go to the next slide. Um, it turns out that people do differ, that personality does matter. It's very interesting research on that coming out because for a long time, um, it looked like personal, we all think personality matters in negotiation, but it turns out in, in ex really hundreds of experiments to be a pretty small factor compared to other things you can do to manipulate the situation. But people do differ in their temperament, in how aware they are of emotions, in how they feel about feelings, like some of us just don't like feeling or experiencing certain feelings, and in how we, how we cope. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, that brings us to some special problems. And I know in the CorpU courses, dealing with difficult people and tactics is one of the really um, popular components of that. But there are other things that I discuss and resolve about how do you negotiate in close relationships? That's a very different thing, it turns out. How do you negotiate on behalf of a group? You're now the president of your neighborhood association, or you're now taking a leadership role negotiating with an external stakeholder. That has some additional key moves. And then the last special problem is that each of us, if we go to the next slide, each of us uh, has a, our own barriers. Um, and, and so it's worth thinking really hard um, and I give people some exercises in the book about what our own obstacles to negotiating better are. So just to wrap up, if we go to the next slide, I think should we encourage confidence? Yes, not, not brazen um, arrogance or foolishness and not even assertiveness because I think there's a danger in telling people, well, you just need to be more assertive. If everybody's more assertive, we, you know, meetings are going to become <laughs> less productive, negotiations may be less productive, but we do want people to be able to assert their interests and to be really um, productive in pursuing their interests. So there's some distinctions there. Um, and if you ask the question, does confidence help or hinder? I think the right kind of confidence undoubtedly helps. And so in my practice now, in addition to helping organizations think about how to make negotiation a critical competitive capability. I'm also working with a lot of executives to help them look at themselves and how they approach conflict differently as a practice. So I'll end there and um, hopefully I've left some time for questions and conversation. Yep, fantastic. So we have questions coming in. If you would like, please type your questions into the question box and I'll start getting those through to Hal. So, so Hal, here's, I'm gonna go first, and uh, I, I loved the, uh, the Albert Brooks video. I thought that was fantastic. I watched it like five times this week. How would you redo that practice uh, for him to achieve more success? So he practiced it with his wife. He got into a high sort of tense situation, and he crumbled immediately. Yeah. Well, the reason he crumbled, I, we can all assume, are that there were things that he cared about other than the $65,000, but his preparation process failed to take any of them into account. All he did was to say, I'm going to practice being really positional. You know, come at me and I'll keep saying 65 over and over and over again. That's how I'm going to prepare. So I think what he didn't take into account is the fact that probably he desperately wanted the job that um, actually his reservation value, because he didn't have any good alternatives, was much lower than 65. That maybe he didn't want to get into an antagonistic interaction with the guy who's gonna be his boss. That, so he should have sh thought a lot more systematically, what's really important to me here? Is it just salary? Am I just gonna go in and hammer away at a position? Because I think what, we, what was revealed is that clearly that wasn't the only thing that was important to him. So, Preparation should be much more holistic and much more systematic and not just going in and practice pounding the table. Yep, got it. Beautiful. So we have a question that came in, um, and I think it, it, it perfectly uh, aligns. What kinds of ways can leaders practice to improve their ability to manage conflict? Yeah, so um, 
there are two ways of answering that question, depending on what the nature of the problem is. If the problem is, how do I manage conflict that I'm part of, then I think um, some of the things that I've described are really helpful, sitting down and thinking, what are the interests of each of the parties here? What are the things that are negotiable? What are the things, if I'm the leader, what are the things that I want to clarify are not negotiable? And that's often very important. And too often, um, this is just an aside, but too often leaders don't clarify what's not negotiable at the outset. And they think that by being, by sounding more collaborative and just listening, I'd like to get your input or, you know, whatever it is. And people give their input. Well, it turned out that a lot of the things they gave their input in, really, they had no ability to influence. And when at the end, when the solution comes out and they now see that, they become very cynical. So clarifying what's not negotiable is crit critical. If we're talking about managing conflict between other groups, um, then I think we want to think about system architecture and we want to think about um, the people who are representing those groups. Are we in a conflict here because of the kind of emotional behaviors? You know, some conflicts really come up because people treat, you know, I mentioned violating a sense of fairness and people treating each other in ways that violate expectations. Sometimes these things get very personal. You know, on a leadership team, there's just a tone of voice that the CFO uses toward the sales VP. And you can see that the sales VP is getting extremely annoyed and is gonna blow and so forth. And so there's some coaching about how we talk to each other and some ground rules for running a meeting would be really helpful. When, this, when the conflict is more systematic, that is you have engineering who care a lot about quality. They're saying, we can't release, we can't release this version of the product yet. We can't do it, it's too buggy. And sales is going, we got to do it, we got to do it, we got to release this, we're going to lose ground, we're going to lose market share. Those are predict what my colleagues, uh, Michael Watkins and Max Basemer, would call predictable surprises. They're going to have versions of that fight all the time. So then the question is, what kinds of norms do I set up in the organization to normalize that conversation and to help everybody realize that the negotiation that results can really be productive? We can do this in a way that helps people understand what's most important to each side and gives us a good enough solution. Um, but too often, I think leaders and teams feel that, it, they, that the conflict is uh, a sign that something is really dysfunctional in the organization. I don't see that at all. I think we pay people to care about different things in organizations. We pay some people to worry about costs. We pay some people to worry about revenues. We pay some people to worry about legal liability. We shouldn't be surprised when they end up in negotiations or conflicts with each other. And it's not enough to just call for alignment or say something else very general. We need to give them the tools to negotiate more effectively. Okay, so a couple questions coming in that are related, um, and so I'll just sort of, I'll summarize them this way. What do you do when senior leadership uh, folks, certain people are not open to direct dialogue? They close themselves off in their own best practice, so they're they're not following a process. Um, there, there's one or two questions about that, and then and while you're thinking about that, how the second one um, that's related is how much do job titles matter in influencing and negotiating with others? So I sort of see common threads there. Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, so let me take them one at a time. So in the case of the person who seems closed off to influence, there's a couple things I would be thinking about. One is I would use a coalition building strategy called backward mapping. So maybe this person doesn't listen to me. Maybe they don't listen to too many people, but there's somebody that they listen to. And the question is, could I get to that person? And who could get to that? Maybe I can't get to them, I'm three levels down. But if we all came up with a recommendation and went to that person, and that person had the conversation, maybe we have a better chance of um, influencing the person who's become walled off from some part of the organization. Uh, I mean, I'll just say, if, if a leader has walled themselves off from the entire uh, organization, that organization is in big trouble and that situation won't last for very long in my experience. Right. Um, but if it's just a question of they walled them off, walled themselves off from some people, then really being curious, you know, who is it that this person listens to? How could we 
get to that person or that group, or maybe it's more than one group, so that the message doesn't come from us but comes from somebody else. The other thing I'd be thinking about doing is forming um, coalitions that can move ahead in some limited ways. So you might be thinking, boy, we really need to reorganize um, completely the way we do customer service or we're going to continue to fall behind. But maybe we haven't been able to convince senior leadership that um, that that's what they should do. We haven't been able to get them to invest in new sales lead technology, whatever it might be. Could we do something on a more modest scale and prove it out? And I see people do that all the time. When I work with organi very large organizations, global organizations, um, you know, one of the things I do is to say, well, you know, you should take a, all take a course together. And, um, and I think, you know, having a course that's online and interactive and can reach people in different continents is a great way to go. But you also need, if you're thinking about, um, if you're thinking about convincing leadership that that was a worthwhile investment, you want to come out the other end and work with a group or groups and help them apply that stuff pretty quickly so that you can then, um, you can then turn around and say what was possible. So I worked with a group in a large life sciences company. I worked with them for a couple of years to help them be better internal coaches and trainers. They were then able to go to senior leaders and say, hey, we've affected, we've, we've now supported and helped prepare people in over 550 key commercial negotiations. And here are some of the responses that we've had from people about the nature of the help. Now senior leadership says, okay, you've shown me something. I'm, I'm willing to invest. And I think these days people are very nervous about doing everything all at once, except in real crisis situations. And it's important to think about coalitions and taking some modest risks so that you can show people uh, a better way of doing things. In terms of the titles um, mattering, I think titles do matter. <laughs> and the reason I say that is I think formal authority is clearly one source of influence. If you report to me, then presumably I have more power to compel you to do something than, than the other way around. But I don't want to think about the fact that you, I'm reporting to you as meaning that I can't influence you or I can't get something done. Um, many organizations are pretty flat. And again, this idea of building coalitions, thinking about interests, thinking about modest steps we can take um, to make progress are, are often the way to go. All right, perfect. So uh, I love, by the way, that backward mapping. Um, forming coalitions, and I love your summary. Titles do matter. So uh, another gr uh, couple questions coming in around how do uh, how do teams and organizations achieve mastery, and what kinds of ways can leaders practice to improve their ability to manage conflict? Yeah. So um, so here's a I'd say sort of there, there's there's three ways um, if I'm going to really boil it down. One is you can practice alone. <laughs> And it seems goofy, right? I'm going to, what are you telling me? I'm going to sit in my office and you look say in the mirror something out loud. <laughs> I wouldn't look in the mirror because I think that does make us incredibly self-conscious and <laughs> it feels even goofier. Um, but what I might do is put a smartphone on my desk and turn on an audio recording and practice saying the first three sentences about what's the purpose of this meeting. Or I might imagine that you've just criticized me in the way that I'm anticipating you're going to criticize me or my idea. Or I've just imagined you've done that thing where you make a silly, you, you know, you sort of make a joke about something that I think is really important and I need to speak up this time. It's good to practice those things. Even if you think in your head about something clever to say, literally try saying it out loud. It's, it's, they're, there are different parts of the brain that organize what we call declarative knowledge and declarative learning and procedural learning. And that's the reason that you can't sort of read a manual about how to swim. You know, you've got to actually do it. And the same thing is true for, um, for practicing. So do it alone. Just, you know, try it. What have you got to lose? The second thing is you can get a, a partner or an ally and say, listen, you got a few minutes. I'm, I got this conversation coming up. I, I, you know, I, I know, I, I don't know quite how to start it and I got some ideas, but could you just, you know, let me tell you about the situation for 60 seconds. Then let me practice a few times and you can give me some feedback or you say to them, listen, you know, could you, I've got this negotiation coming up. 
this is the person I'm going to deal with. These are their key behaviors most of the time. These are some of the issues I'm worried about. Do you mind sitting down with me for a half hour and just let me role play some of this stuff and give me some feedback? And in my experience, even if the feedback itself isn't particularly insightful, just again, the doing is tremendously beneficial. And why is that? Well, one of the reasons is <clears throat> even if you're in a situation and the person does the thing that drives you crazy, if you predicted that they were going to do it, it gives you this sense of, yep, I knew this was coming, I predicted this, and you actually stay a little cooler than you would if you kind of just avoided thinking about it and then they do it and it's like, once again, you're doing this thing. So that's the second way, is find an ally. And then the third way is to do it in a group. And the pitfall here is that um, I've watched companies who put people in a room and, uh, and they say, okay, good, we're gonna have senior management watch you do this negotiation. And so senior management forms a semicircle around the negotiating team and they hire a really credible person to be the counterparts. And they watch the negotiation go on for an hour and a half. And then at the end, everybody piles on and says every possible criticism. It's as if you sort of were getting coached in tennis and you play the whole tennis match. And then somebody says, yeah, I'd like to go back to game four when you had that second service. <clears throat> you know, you really didn't, you know, <laughs> it's almost <laughs> useless. I mean, People will be polite and try to take it in, but it's totally overwhelming. So what you really want to do is to <clears throat> manage, facilitate that interaction, make sure that the right people are in the room and not in the room, because sometimes it's better to have them watching on, on video, um, and then manage the, feed, manage the things they practice into discrete chunks, manage the feedback so that they don't get too much of it, distill the feedback into one or two key points, let them practice again. That's a much better way of rehearsing in a group, and I think companies are flailing at this a little bit, um, spending a lot of money orchestrating complex mock negotiations that really don't do anything but traumatize the people who have to go through it. Um, so those are the three ways I would say, uh, by yourself, with a partner, and in a group. Yep, love it. Very, uh, very helpful. So we only have, in a, in, in a minute or less, Hal, can, can you talk about the benefits of System 2 thinking? And I'm wondering, do they relate to this practice? Can we, can we practice System 2 thinking to get to make it System 1? We absolutely can. And one of the things I watch organizations that are better at negotiations doing is to create their own process map and their own checklist for preparation, their own kind of shorthand that says, hey, have we spent enough time thinking about the other side's consequences if there's an impasse? What happens to them if we don't get an agreement? What's their best alternative? What might they pursue? What's ours? You know, do we really know their interests? You ask people, what are, what's the other side's interest? No, they're all about price. Okay, well, that's an issue, first of all, but what do you mean by that? Why are they all about price? What problems are they trying to solve? What does price mean? So unfortunately, people don't, aren't as diligent as they should be, but I think better organizations that do this better are starting to catch on and create their own customized tools, and that's something that I've helped uh, a number of teams do. Well, thank you. I think there's a lot of power in unpacking these things deeper and further, and I know we do um, a lot of this in our, um, in our online programs, and, uh, and we're really excited to talk today about uh, practice and negotiations and building greater confidence. And what I'd say is a couple of people asked if I, well, what books do I recommend? I, I, I would recommend uh, Resolve because what you're getting with Resolve, which is Hal's latest book, um, this is this is sort of state of the art in the thinking and behavioral psychology and what's happening in the world of negotiation from the guy that co-authored the best-selling book, Built to Win, which is about building organizational capability around negotiation and building that uh, that for the enterprise. And so thank you so much, Hal, for being with us today. Thank you all uh, in our uh, audience. Up up next, uh, June 19th, we have Penn State and Achieve It, our partners talking about supply chain. Uh, and this one's technical, which we t tend to not do on uh, on webinars, but there's so much going on in the world of supply chain. This comes from Penn State Smeal School of Business, and it's about cash to cash cycle time. So I'm excited to hear about what that is. That'll be with us June 19th. Thanks again, Hal Movius, the author of Resolve and our lead faculty and expert in Art of Negotiations program from Corp U. Everyone have a great day. Thanks all.